and he's going to tell us about breaking integrability in classical field theories. Please. Okay, is the sound okay? Is better? Okay. Great. Okay. Yes, the echo is quite strong. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, thank you very much. So I should first apologize for not being Uber, uh, but and uh, second, I mean, so I, I fear that some people a may have seen that. So this was prepared very much at the last minute, and is sort of recycling something. So it's perhaps not quite directed at the right audience. So if bits of it are telling you things that you've known since you were about two, then you know, parts of this were meant for an audience of pure mathematicians and I had to explain stuff to them. So anyway, those are my apologies in advance. So I talk about a sort of little sideline. I mean, most of the time I am interested in you know, integrable systems. I spent uh, integral quantum field theories and so on, but I, maybe about 10 years ago now, I started thinking a little bit about ways to break integrability and discovered there's this whole world of activity where people think about this, even in the context of very simple classical field theories where there are surprisingly complicated phenomena going on. And it's kind of quite fun to explore. Initially, I had some projects with some undergraduates, some of whom are, are listed on here, and I kind of got into it. And I'd like to just describe a little bit of the sort of stuff that we've been doing. And we're still thinking about it now. We had a paper quite recently, so I'll talk about that a bit later too. And so I guess in terms of the things of this conference, well, integrability is there in the sense it's being broken. So a little bit. Uh, duality, not so much. Deformation, well, the deformations are bad deformations. I think most of the deformations people discuss here preserve integrability in some sense, but these don't. Anyway, too bad. Okay, good. Let's uh, try and get this. So yes, here's the sort of plan. So I, I think the model I'd like to highlight most, I'm going to go through a bit of a detour, is ways where you break integrability just at the boundary. So we already heard a little bit about boundary field theories, for example, in Kostya's talk. And I kind of like to advertise, this isn't something that we've done yet, but I'd like to advertise that I think a, 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 the long-term goal of this might be to understand the whole structure of breaking of integrability in quantum field theories, and perhaps just breaking integrability at the boundary is a nice place to start. And I'll try and illustrate that even if you just, you know, you've got a system essentially defined on a half line, you only break integrability at the boundary, it still messes everything up and gives you a very complicated structure. And I'd like to illustrate that a little bit. But in fact, to understand the phenomena that's going on, you have to go back to a much older story, which is non-integrable theories in the bulk and how they have a much more complicated scattering of their excitations than you would find in the integrable theories that we usually know about. And that actually turns out in some senses to be a simpler situation. And so I'll go back and talk about the bulk story for a while. And depending on the time, I may skip some of these intermediate sections and then get back to the boundary sine gordon theory, which is a classic example of breaking integrability at the boundary towards the end. Okay, good. Okay, so here's some of the stuff that you all know since you were two. So we all know about the sine gordon model. We know it has multiple vacua and we can have initial conditions set up such that our vacua plus and minus infinity are different, which gives us kinks, okay? Now, of course, the interesting thing is that these kinks also arise in non-integrable models and we'll look at that later, but anyway, you do get kinks. And just to test whether the audio works, here's an example of sign Gordon kinks that we made. In, uh, that's in South Africa. Actually, people know about Ames. I'm actually wearing, I've got the t-shirt. Uh, this was, and so does anyone recognize anyone in the background? No, it's too blurry. Anyway, David Gross <laughs> taking the photographs. Right. So the interest here was to switch to a half line, okay? And to make this problem well posed, just classically, we need a boundary condition. This was surprising, I mean, sine Gordon has been known to be integra integrable since forever, but a full answer to even the simplest class of boundary conditions uh, that would preserve integrability uh, was not found until about, I think, 95. Okay, and this is like the baby example of the sorts of things that Costa was talking about, I think, or part of what he was talking about. And if we don't include additional sort of dynamical boundary degrees of freedom with their own kinetic energy and so on, there's a two parameter family of options that was found by Gershwin and Samologikov in the 94, not 95, okay? So you impose a boundary condition that says that UX plus this slightly weird function. So the sine Gordon model itself involves sines and cosines of U minus U. And then you have to sort of divide by two to get the correct thing for the boundary condition. And you impose this condition and for any K and U hat, that's integrable. Initially, these guys 
Well, in fact, the first, the cases of Dirichlet and Neumann, which are special limits of this, were known for a long time, and they're kind of obviously integrable because you can try to do a reflection trick to construct solutions for those cases. And the more general set was found basically by imposing that the first non-trivial conserved charge of higher spin, a sort of a, 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 um, a symmetric combination of the plus and minus spin versions had to be conserved as well. And then later on, people like McIntyre constructed lax pairs for this system and showed that there were then an infinite set of conserved charges on the half line. And as was commented last time, basically you get half the charges and it kind of matches the idea that the line has got half as many, a half line has half as many degrees of freedom roughly as a whole line. So it kind of all makes sense, okay? And once you're in that situation, then you have these conservation laws and scattering gets constrained in just the same way as it does for bulk S matrices. And it's simple, and even in the classical theory is simple. So here's my, these movies don't have sound, but uh, so we can fire on the uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. It just comes back as an anti-kink. Okay, it's going down, so it's an anti-kink. Or we can fire the thing in with, oh, I'm not sure why it's gone blank, but uh, never mind. Let's hope it goes away. Okay. Uh, okay, it's back. Good. Okay, but as I've advertised, I mean, you know, reality isn't integrable, sadly, or maybe luckily. And so um, it's an interesting way to think about keeping integrability in the bulk. So excitation in the bulk will still scatter in a nice way, but doing something non integrable at the bulk and see what effect that has. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is bad news. Okay, maybe it was just the connector. Okay, a natural choice is to use what's called a Robert condition. So instead of using the Gauchat Zamodical thing, we kind of linearize it and impose a version without the sign. Okay, so we just get rid of the sign. Okay. And these are two, two limits of this. So K to infinity is Dirichlet and K equals naught is Neumann. Those are both integrable conditions again, but in between for little k non-zero and non-infinite, this Robert boundary condition doesn't, so even though it looks simpler than the integrable boundary condition, it doesn't interact nicely with the conservation laws. Okay, so there's no reason to expect scattering to be simple. And indeed it isn't. Is this working still? Okay, okay, good. Okay, so here's a sequence sort of going between Dirichlet to Neumann of little movies of what happens. So you just put this on a computer. It's actually quite fun to simulate these things on a computer. Okay, so it's nearly Dirichlet. So we have a, an anti-kink coming in and you can see that what we have reflected back to us is again, it's an anti-kink plus some extra stuff. Okay, so it's going a bit more slowly than it would have done. And there's some radiation, maybe some other stuff. It's not quite clear. Okay, now let's go to the next case on. So we're going from Dirichlet, where the, the anti-kink reflects as an anti-kink, towards Neumann, where the anti-kink would reflect back as a kink. So here, well, it looks like it's still an anti-kink, but with a bit more radiation, perhaps some other excitations going on there. Let's do, an, I've got two more to go, three more to go. Okay, so now, well, it seems like the anti-kink has been lost. Get through these fairly fast. Okay, now that looks like perhaps a kink anti-kink pair. And the last one is getting much closer to the Neumann situation. Okay. But these were all for one specific initial velocity, okay, 0.95 of the speed of light. Okay, and the question is now, what's the overall picture? So now if I try and sort of pop plot what we sort of loosely call a phase diagram, where on the horizontal axis, I'll put different values of this parameter K, and on the vertical axis, I'll put different values of the initial velocity, and I'll try and plot what happens at the end. Okay, and the simplest sort of probe for that is just to ask what the value of the field is at large times in the future. And you can see from those little movies I showed that in some cases the field value in the far future was still at uh, zero, in some cases it was two pi, in some cases it was four pi. Uh, 
And that tells you something about the soliton content of the final state. Okay, well, here's the picture. So you just, essentially each pixel of this picture requires you to run that simulation until a large enough time that things near the boundary have settled down. And then you just record the value of the field at the origin, and then you move on to the next pixel. Okay, so it requires a lot of uh, computer time just to sort of map this out. And you have to wait, at least the way I've described it so far, you have to wait long enough that the situation at the boundary has settled down. So all the radiation has disappeared off to infinity before you take your measurement. Okay, and then you can be fairly sure you've, you've discovered the sort of future of the thing. And roughly speaking, as I say, these different colors correspond to either a kink coming back at you, an anti-kink, or perhaps neither or both. So sort of total topological charge zero, and you can't distinguish those two at the moment. Okay, so this looks complicated. And when we first looked at this, we saw well, there's a slightly odd, odd region around here. Okay, so blurry region around here. And we thought, well, probably we haven't just done the computer right. So we zoomed in and we found this extremely complicated structure. Okay, if we keep on zooming in on that, we found almost like a fractal structure of different possible outcomes. Okay, so the blue bands are when an anti kink is emitted, green when there's just a breather. We're actually out of the region apart from the very top left where kinks get emitted. And then there's these intermediate regions where a teeny little change, it's sort of chaos going on basically, a teeny little change in my initial condition, like my initial velocity, will change the fate of the outcome significantly. Okay, and this, well, at least to us, was kind of a surprise. Okay, so that's the sort of thing we'd like to explore. Okay, so the question is, well, a practical question is, how do we, distinct, how do we disentangle this final state? At the moment, we've just taken one probe, how do we find out whether it's got a kink and an anti-kink in it or nothing or breathers, right? We know that sine Gordon model contains breathers or radiation or whatever, okay? We've done a rather crude probe. And also for our current method, we have to wait a long time. So in principle, you could just run your computer an even longer time and look over the whole half line and you know, in the very long future, sine Gordon excitations will separate themselves out and you'll find, but is there a better way, okay? And more generally, what's the reason for this fractal structure? Okay, where's you know, in this, this particular region of this phase diagram, there's this complicated structure. Where's that come from? What, what's, what's behind that? What's the physical mechanism for causing that? Can we understand that mathematically? Okay, well, for the first part, so I'll try and get to this at the end of the talk and so I have a little bit more of a link with integrability. It turns out that we can exploit the integrability of the bulk model to make a sort of effective numerical technique for disentangling the soliton content of the final state using part of the inverse scattering method and implementing it numerically to find out what's going on at the end. And so that was kind of fun uh, to, to make work. And so I'll talk about that if I get time at the end. And for the second part, it turns so this second issue about why it is that there's this extremely intricate fractal structure. It turns out that actually sine Gordon is rather a bad place to start to think about this because it's got so many different possible ex stable excitations Right, you've got the kink and the anti-kink, but also a whole, in the classical theory, a whole continuous spectrum of breathers. This complicates the story a lot. So to explain the sort of mechanism that turns out to be at work, which I'll try and explain at the end, it's easier to look at a case where in fact bulk integrability is lost as well as any other sort of integrability. And in fact, the simplest case is just a full line problem where bulk integrability is lost. So I'll, I'll run through that next. It's a bit of sort of historical story dating back to the 70s. And that's what I'll talk about next. And once we've understood that, you should be able to believe that similar mechanisms are at work actually in very, very many classical field theories which have kink-like excitations. So it's a rather ubiquitous phenomenon, in fact, and more and more ubiquitous as time goes by. And something that if you spend your whole life just talking about integral models, you don't see. So that's nice. So here's the bulk story. So I'm gonna go back to, again, telling you stuff that you all know well about. We'll start with the, the simplest theory you can think of, phi four theory, okay? so. Two vacua. So instead of infinitely many vacua, we've just got these two vacua, and now we can have just a kink or an anti kink going between the two. Okay, so this is one of the most studied models. And we're again thinking in just one plus one direct dimension, but you know, these are models of domain walls in higher dimensions, etc. Okay, so we have kinks and anti kinks with energy densities localized. And an important thing for later is just to, to, to re remind yourself that you can do a little calculation and find that a kink and an anti-kink actually attract each other. So there's an attractive force and that will be important later. I'll get to that later, okay, but just a fact. Good. So if you take a kink and an anti-kink and you boost them in opposite directions and shoot them at each other, 
then it turns out they bounce off each other. They sort of, they don't bounce through each other, but they bounce off each other because there's not the sort of space in the set of vacua to bounce, to pass through each other in the same way as sine Gordon, but they just sort of bounce off each other. Again, if you fire them fast enough, that's what they do. They end up going out a little bit slower than they came in because some radiation is created because the model is not integrable. So there's a coupling. <clears throat> so here's a movie. So the top is sort of creating a map of what's going on. The bottom is CZAS is Polish for time, apparently. My collaborator, Tom, is uh, Polish. For time. So you can see what's happened is that the final velocities are a little bit less than the initial velocity, and some energy has been lost in various ways to other modes. Quite what other modes is going to be important later. Okay, and that was for an initial velocity of 0.27 in this case. Okay, just keep track of that. Okay. Now, what you'd expect is that, you know, given that the kink and the anti-kink attract each other, then if the velocity gets reduced below some critical value, then the outgoing kink and anti-kink won't have escape velocity. Okay, so they will crunch back into each other. Okay, and then they kind of, at least naively, you think that you're, you're sort of stuffed. They'll just sort of end up in a sort of wobbly configuration. And they actually form a rather interesting state, which is still not fully understood, which is called an oscillon. So there's a surprisingly long lived oscillating state, which is sort of analog of the sine Gordon breather. So it does ultimately decay, but very, very slowly. That's a further interesting thing. So here's an example where an oscillon is created. Okay, so they're coming in a little bit slow, not 0.27, but 0.24. You see, they try to escape, but they don't quite make it. And they end up in this sort of blubbery, jelly thing. And then that just sort of carries on. If you wait an extremely long time, okay, I think formally the lifetime is infinite if you think about normal definitions of lifetimes of states. But ultimately, it will all turn into just a vacuum with a bunch of radiation going out to infinity because it's consistently coupled with radiation. Okay. So that's all unsurprising. But if you reduce the velocity a little bit further, so we went from 0.27 to 0.24, and what people found, they just played around, if you reduce the velocity a little bit further, so this is now 0.225, here's what you see, okay? So they, but now they escape. Okay, so they sort of, get liberated again when you've reduced the velocity. So your velocity has come down, your sort of curve of final velocity against initial velocity has come down to zero when they're captured, but then you reduce the initial velocity a bit further and suddenly you can escape again. Okay, so there's an what, what, what gets called in the trade a window, an escape window of velocities below this upper critical velocity where soliton, where kink capture first occurred. Okay, where they're again able to separate, they're sort of liberated again. Again, it was in fact, it was first observed by some of the sort of classic soliton people, Ablevitz, Krushkal, and Ladik, uh, in the 70s. Okay, of course, at that point, computing power was rather weak, and it turns out that these effects are very, as, as we maybe saw in the sine Gordon example, really, you might anticipate that they depend very, very sensitively on initial conditions. Okay, so understanding all that was tricky. But in the 80s, people like Campbell and collaborators understood it, and this is still active. So there's, a, there's I'll, I'll cite it a bit later, but uh, really the mathematical understanding of that, there's a, there's a paper just this year by Nick Manton and collaborators, which is again, further advanced the sort of understanding of this. So it's still an active subject of research to understand what's going on, but the basic mechanism behind it was really understood by Campbell and co in the eighties. And, but just to do some numerics, here's, here's the picture. So we get this sort of sequence of windows, which are called, so the initial sequence of windows with processes like the ones I showed just now. Okay, so I think the one I showed, first of all, I showed a plot in this region, and then I showed, I think, a plot where it was 0.225. So I guess it was a little scattering process. And this, it would turn out that if we reduce the velocity still further, there's a slightly wider window. And there's this sequence of windows accumulating at the critical velocity. Now there's a question. Hi. Uh, so those peaks, do they converge geometrically? Do they converge geometrically the, the, the position of those peaks? I 
Offhand, I can't, they, they certainly accumulate. I can't remember the precise law off the, offhand. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you later. I mean, yeah, because it, it looks very much like yeah, some yeah, things yeah. that you have in chaos with the. Yeah, yeah. No, there, there's a simple formula, but I, right. off the top of my head, I would give it to you. But based on this mechanism, we can probably even figure it out as we go along. Okay. But then more complicated still. So at the edge of each of these windows, there's a set of what are called baby windows. So here's. The, the, the lowest and biggest window. And if you look even more closely, you'll find a set of windows on the edge of that window, which again accumulate towards the end of the edge of that window. Okay. And then if you looked at the edge of any of those windows, you'd see a further sequence. So there's this nested sort of fractal like structure going on. And as computers got better, people have probed this more and more. They've now found sort of down to, I think, about 10 or so, they can still find this nesting structure preserved. Okay. And inside these first nested windows, and you can start to see where the nesting is coming from. It turns out that the kinks bounce three times. So here's a first example. And then they escape. Okay, so remember, at high velocities, they just bang, one bounce. And then in this first window, it went bang, bang, and out. And now it's and out. And you can imagine that we could, in principle, have an infinite sequence of these things. And each one's sort of sitting at the edge of the next one. So that's the picture. Okay. So why is this happening? What's the mechanism of Campbell and Co? Well, the key point is that, in fact, the, the way that the energy gets lost isn't in, if, if the energy from the scattering was lost just to radiation, it would be gone. And there's no way to get it back. But what actually happens is that these kinks in the 5-4 theory have an internal mode, what's called a wobble mode. And we can analyze that easily. You just look at the equation of motion for small oscillations. Again, this is all undergraduate level stuff that you can do. And you find a little Schrodinger equation governing those. And for the case of the sine Gordon kink, this thing has just a single bound state corresponding to the translation of the kink and no internal wobble mode. Whereas for the phi four kink, which looks on its face actually very similar, there are two eigenvalues to this problem. So one of them is again, just encoding the fact that any solution you translate it a bit, it's again a solution. Okay, but the other one is an internal wobble mode with a specific frequency. As I say, the translation mode would be there for any kink theory, but the spectrum of these internal wobbles depends from theory to theory, depends on the particular potential that you use. Again, you can find models with two, three, four wobble modes. Five, four, it turns out it's just got one, which makes everything much clearer. And you can see this. If you, if you start the system off a sort of static single kink with just a, a slightly distorted shape, you can see there's this characteristic frequency at which it's oscillating and it's giving off a little bit of radiation, but quite slowly. And you can also see it being excited even in the initial scattering. So now we, we look back at that initial scattering and we see that most of the energy had actually gone into this wobble, nowhere else. Okay. And if the velocities are just below this critical velocity, then as I said before, we don't quite have escape velocity, so we sort of set these things off and they, they're going to recollide. Okay, but if at the moment of recollision, the situation is a time reversal of the initial collision, then the energy in the initial collision went from the translational mode into the wobble mode. If you take the time reversal of that, it'll go from the wobble mode back into the translational mode. So you'll take, you sort of put the energy into this battery, this wobble mode, and now you've reclaimed it. It's a bit like you know, you're breaking your electric car and then you're trying to accelerate out of the traffic lights again. And this has to happen. You don't need to know any details of the dynamics of that collision to know that a time reversal will put the energy back, provided that not too much energy is lost to radiation, which seems to be the case here. Okay, and this might happen. You might hit the sweet spot in terms of the relative wobble, wobble phase compared to the internal mode. So first of all, obviously you can, do, you can do this after one wobble, two wobbles, three wobbles. So that explains why you have a sequence of windows. And actually you can also understand why it accumulates. So I think we can do the calculation and we'll see the precise accumulation law this follows from, from this basic approximation, okay? But also it might happen that on the first attempt, you don't quite have the right velocity, but on the second attempt you do, okay? Or on the third attempt. And this explains the nested structure. So it gives a very nice sort of phenomenological explanation of what's going on. And you can develop a more quantitative theory of this. Now this actually 
it was it was sort of slightly long story. You can develop a story where you, you develop sort of moduli space of, approach for this, where you have essentially reduced numbers of degrees of freedom. So one degree of freedom for the position of the kink and its velocity, and one degree of freedom for the energy in the wobble mode. And people tried to develop this. And in fact, there was a, a paper from a long time ago where they sort of produced an effective Lagrangian for this situation. And there was actually a typo in it. And the weird thing was that this typo actually made in, in the calculation, things seemed to work okay. And then many years later, quite recently, people spotted this typo. And then actually the thing didn't work nearly so well. And this was a little bit of mystery for a while. And this is the thing that's just been recently resolved in the paper by Manton and Dow where they realize that you have to, in some sense, blow up the moduli space at the points when these kinks are bumping into each other. And, uh, uh, and now there seems to be a, a, a genuinely effective understanding of this from almost first principles. So this is quite nice. But you can see, if we look again at this, this movie of what's going on, you can see that this is really what's going on. So let, let's look again at the two band scattering. And you can see the pattern in that central blob, okay, is symmetrical under time reversal again, under flipping the picture. So you can kind of believe that that's what's happened. Okay, And obviously it's not perfect. We're not an integrable system. So energy is being lost a little bit. And whether this nesting structure works down to, you know, it's really a fractal structure down to infinitely small levels is still not really known, but anyway. Okay, but the key features to see whether we can see these in other models is what we need are some sort of attractive force so that there's this risk of mutual capture. They just don't bounce off each other, come what may. And some sort of battery with some sort of periodicity, okay, like the wobble of the kink, so that we have the possibility of giving this energy back after one, two, three, four periods. Okay. And so there's been a little bit of an industry in sort of finding out that this is a very ubiquitous mechanism. So, in some cases, it works in slightly different ways. For example, in some cases, your battery actually resides, you can have a pair of kinks, for example, in the phi six theory, which is like phi four, but with three vacua, it turns out that the kinks themselves do not have wobble modes. So you might think none of this happens, but the, the vacuum between two kinks is not equivalent to the vacuum, or at least can be set up to be not equivalent to the vacua on the other side. And that means that you can store some energy in between the two kinks, there's a wobble mode there. Okay, so that was one thing. Or it can be in some sort of quasi-normal mode, which you might call a leaky battery. Okay, And it also can be seen when we fire kinks at boundaries. So I'm, I'm going to run out of time at some point, so I might scoot through this a little bit quickly. But another little project we had was to look at what happens when you set up some sort of boundary condition, a little bit like the boundary conditions we looked at before, for the phi th 4 theory on a half line. Again, this is an interesting deformation of the previous problem, because if you think about firing a kink and an anti-kink towards each other, Okay, in a symmetrical situation, you could equally view that collision as being a Neumann boundary condition situation on a half line with a single kink. Okay, so then a natural deformation of that would be to sort of impose some sort of boundary magnetic field or something and see how this picture of windows distorts itself as we go away from this point, which also corresponds to a bulk problem. Okay, so you can have some fun with that. There are different sort of static solutions, different forces. I am going to skip this slightly fast, partly because I don't want to finish late because I've got to go for my <laughs> PCR test in a minute, <laughs> for the return flight. So uh, anyway, uh, it, the whole picture sort of distorts a bit. So I said for, for zero boundary magnetic fields, which is my boundary condition here, we can think about this thing as a full line problem. And for non-zero, this picture distorts. And there's a sort of slightly curious force law here, slightly more complicated force law than the previous one with two components. And that's interesting because this force is actually repulsive at large distance while attractive at short distances. So there's a sort of hill that your incoming kink has to climb in some regimes. And that means that if you have a small enough initial velocity, your kink never gets close to the wall. It sort of gets just repelled almost perfectly back. Here's a picture of such a scattering. Okay, so these are almost perfectly elastic. It's almost like an integrable scattering. You, can't never, you, know, you, you never excite any extra degrees of freedom. You get a very simple scattering process. Okay. And that corresponds to sort of trying to climb up this hill towards the boundary where everything is going to be very complicated, but not quite making it to the top and rolling back down again. Okay. There's obviously a critical velocity when you get exactly to the top of the hill okay, and end up sort of just perched on top of the hill out to t equals infinity. And you can calculate that critical velocity. Okay, it's just a simple bit of energetics. And you find then 
that up to that critical, so, so this first little vertical line here is the critical velocity, and up to that critical velocity, scattering is almost perfectly elastic. And after that, of course, you go over the top of the hill, you sort of fall into the boundary, you excite all sorts of complicated boundary excitations, and so all hell breaks loose, and you start getting this window structure again. Okay, so that leads to a rather pretty picture where our prediction, so, so this, this little formula with the square root in it is our prediction of the critical velocity, and that lets us do a rather accurate, you know, this is numerically extremely accurate for this lower window, and then the whole structure of further windows. So for example, if we look at this, the slice of this at zero, then these little blue things are the windows we talked about before. This is just a picture for bulk phi four scattering. But there are sort of distortions of this, and it's quite interesting to understand what this deformation is doing. And again, we don't have a terribly good analytic understanding of that, but it's certainly something to look at. And one other feature that we found sort of by accident in this series, which I'd like to explain, so it'll get on to my little movie later, is that we, we realized that there's actually, as well as the bulk oscillation, there's a tunable boundary mode where the boundary the field at the boundary can oscillate with a frequency which depends on the value on the particular boundary condition that we've imposed. Okay, and you can find that frequency as a function for small oscillations, quite simply. And for small values of h, okay, then this frequency is bigger than the lowest frequency for bulk radiation, or twice this frequency. And that means the second harmonic, obviously, the frequency itself can't couple directly to the, band, uh, the bulk modes, otherwise it would just decay immediately. But via this sort of second harmonic, you get decay of the boundary, okay? Which means that that mode decays relatively rapidly, all right? But when you make H larger, that frequency gets less. And when H gets, below, gets above a particular value, so it's stated here, okay? Then this frequency, is let twice that frequency is, is less than the, the frequency of, of for, for bulk radiation. So the second harmonic can no longer couple with the bulk. And you have to go through the third harmonic and the coupling of that is smaller. Okay, it's harder to couple through a third harmonic than a second harmonic. So there's a much slower decay rate. So you get sort of decay rate of this oscillating state which depends on this tunable parameter. Okay. Well, that's okay, that's kind of interesting. But more interesting is that if you consider now a single oscillation at some fixed value of H, but make its amplitude bigger, then just as with a sort of classical nonlinear pendulum, right, when the amplitude gets bigger, the frequency gets lower, right? It's sort of climbing and then slows down. So if you've got a large amplitude thing, it can be over this threshold and unable to couple to the bulk radiation via its second harmonic. But when its amplitude gets less, it's going to suddenly become able to couple. So you imagine the thing oscillating with this large frequency where this, this second harmonic decay mode is forbidden to it. But of course, it still decays a little bit, so it decays sort of slowly. But at some point, this frequency is going to be rising as its amplitude decreases. It's going to pass this threshold, and then suddenly you're going to sort of fall off a cliff and have this new decay channel open to you, which will mean you'll decay more quickly. Okay. So if you sort of suitably fiddle things, you can make this work. So here's a picture of this at work. So we have the field itself illustrated here. And then here is the, the field at the origin. Okay, and here's the frequency down the bottom. And you can see it's just going up to this critical value of one. When it reaches it, suddenly the amplitude decreases. And this lower left picture showing the radiation a bit further out, you see this burst of radiation being emitted. Okay, so I think physically this is rather an interesting phenomenon. And in a moment, I'm going to show you how to see this in other situations too. But this was the first place we saw this. Okay, so <laughs> rather, well, the thing is, so relatively stable for a while, and suddenly bang, it collapses. Right. So we'll say we found that sort of by accident. And we wondered whether we could find some other examples or cook up some models where this happened. It turned out that you can. So a natural place to look, first of all, would be let's go to the Sine Gordon model, which has a bunch of states called. The, these breather states and their frequencies increase as their amplitude decreases. These are all starting off a bunch of breathers with slightly different amplitudes. And you'll see that the small amplitude ones have a higher frequency than the big amplitude ones. Okay, it's about expected. Okay, so. But there's a problem with that. Okay, so we, you know, so, so we think this is a good situation because we're going to have this sort of amplitude dependence of the frequency, which might mean that decays get affected. 
But of course, the sine Gordon breathers don't decay, they live forever. So what we're going to do is take what's basically a sine Gordon model and just break integrability a teeny bit, okay, add a little thing so the breathers will slowly decay, and then we'll have this drift of frequency as before. Okay, so we'll take the Lagrangian with the sine Gordon part, and then we'll add with epsilon a little sort of perturbing part, which is actually a bit like a phi four theory again. So it's sort of interpolating between the two. We found this a, a very good toy model for playing around with these sorts of things. Okay. And so the breather still exists in this state, but it's in fact, it's now secretly an oscillon. It will slowly decay for small values of epsilon. There's a small coupling to radiation. Okay. And so we'll have this drift of frequency of this thing. And then we'd expect to see something interesting happen when this drifting frequency passes some of these, actually now an infinite sequence of thresholds where one harmonic gets coupled or decoupled from what can be a decay channel. Okay, so now I've got some pictures of this, which I'm gonna try and persuade the computer to do. So we actually made this with a soundtrack. So let me know if you can hear it, so. Okay, so you can hear that it sort of drifts and then suddenly bang. Okay, and if we look at what the field is doing out away from the origin, then you actually hear a sort of ringing tone as the bursts of radiation go past you. So this is a sort of oscillating, well, breather, decay, but decaying breather, which every now and then spits out this sort of what we call a staccato burst of radiation. Okay, good. was that audible? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so and we, were, we were doing this about the same time as these black hole, you know, LIGO and stuff, stuff was coming out. So we thought it was a little bit similar to the, the noise of a decaying black hole. Uh, anyway, that was a bit frivolous, but I think it, it's, it's quite a fun phenomenon. And, and one interesting question is how much this persists in higher dimensions. So you can also have oscillons in higher dimensions. Now there's a paper by Gabo Takash and a student where they studied a particular case where they found it didn't happen. But we do have some other examples where it does. And certainly we found this not just in, the, in this deformed sine Gordon model, we also found it in one plus one dimensions in, for example, the phi six theory. So we believe the thing can crop up. And we, did, we have cooked up, though we haven't written this up. We have got some examples in higher dimensions where the same thing seems to happen. So I think it's something to look out for. And I think this phenomena of, sort of <coughs> frequency drift and then change of the possible decay channels is something which might be interesting to look at further. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, and um, turn out this model, so we quite like this model, so we, we have looked at it <coughs> rather more. And the scattering turns out to be very intricate as well, partly because actually in, in, a, in a sort of further limit of this thing, so it starts off as sine Gordon, then you have the phenomenon of integrability breaking which takes you towards the 5-4 model. As you deform it even further, you actually get to something which is akin to the 5-6 model, where your kinks sort of fractionate into half kinks. So your initial kink fractionates into, and this was actually proposed as a sort of, I read it, there's a paper by Christ and Lee of a similar model. They talk about this as a sort of bag model for quarks and so on. There's a very interesting sort of structure of the scattering in these cases as well. And that was the subject of our recent paper, but I won't go into that anymore. Right, okay, so back in the last five, 10 minutes, to the boundary sign Gordon model and this question about how, to, how, you know, how all this translates into my initial question. Okay. So we have this extra issue, which I haven't really mentioned before, which is that it's very hard to distinguish the breather states from just a bit of radiation. That's the sort of further question that we're, we're, we're stuck with. Okay, so there's this much richer structure of long lived excitation than there was in the case of sign Gordon. So again, we're, we're putting it on a half line we ask and if we wait long enough so so this is now my sort of advert for this is an interesting situation because even though the boundary is non-integrable if you wait long enough all of the excitations will have left the boundary region and they're they're, they're going to be propagating in a region where the equations of motion are completely integrable okay so the sort of space of states can be categorized using integrable technology right? there's just a sort of small space of time when stuff is happening near this non-integral boundary so it's non-integrable for a sort of finite amount of time and then everything becomes integrable again okay so you sort of pass through this bad phase when things are going complicated and then you're back out again so it's like sort of 
you've got control of the space of states in a better way than you would have done. Okay. But as we've said before, it, it's sort of tedious if you just have to wait until everything disentangles itself. And fortunately, we can use the inverse scattering. So this is, we can use ideas from, again, I'll, I'll zoom through this slightly fast. But if we had a theory on the full line, we could use the classic inverse scattering ideas to disentangle the soliton content of any state just from the scattering data of the associated linear problem. Okay, and so I just write down what the formulae are here. Okay, but in principle, if you can diagonalize that, you know, if you can compute that problem, you could work it out. Now, of course, we're not on a full line, we're on a half line. But if you waited a reasonable time, but not infinitely far, the excitations will still be far from the boundary. So then you can make a little sort of cut. So I put two little dotted lines here, and I take out that half line configuration, and I embed it in a full line configuration where I just pretend that the field has tended to a constant beyond the two dotted lines. Okay, and then I can apply this inverse scattering technique numerically to compute the spectrum of that linear problem, okay, and look for the scattering data, okay, and in these two cases I found in this case one eigenvalue, and in this case two, okay, and so from that I can read off in a sort of automatic, uh, automated way the soliton content of that without just eyeballing it and telling myself, well, okay, this one looks like a kink and this one looks like a kink and an anti-kink. Okay, so you can kind of put this on your computer and run it. So here's another example. Okay, so that one corresponds to, it turns out, a breather. This one, again, you wouldn't be so sure what this configuration corresponded to, but it turns out it's, it's got a, a kink, well, an anti-kink, and a breather and some radiation. Okay, whereas in this case, it was just a breather. And you can, my student Robert Perini was extremely good at coding all this up in, in, in Python and searching for zeros of the relevant Ronskins and so on. And you find, so, so this, this was now done numerically, and we find a near perfect match with the previous snapshot. Okay, so everything kind of matches as it kind of should, but we've got a slightly more efficient way of studying it. Okay. And now we can understand, given what we've, we've, we've spoken about before, we understand a little bit more about this structure too. Okay. What's happening, so the key feature that understands this phenomenon sine gordon that the sine gordon kink itself does not oscillate. Okay, it's got no internal mode. So that's not the mechanism. But the breather does. Okay, so the breather can be our little periodic battery. So what's happening is that there are situations where an initial collision of a kink with the boundary produces a breather in the, final, in the initial final state, which is attracted back towards the boundary and then the way this scatters against the boundary can depend on the phase that that thing has when it recollides. And so you get again this complicated fractal structure. Okay, now we haven't gone that much further in analyzing the details of that and producing concrete predictions, but we think we understand at least the basic mechanism at work. Good. Okay, so I'm finishing on time. That was handy. Okay, so the conclusions. So again, it's a little bit off topic for this conference, but I'd say that these nonlinear theories can be surprisingly complicated. I, mean, I don't think I'd have guessed before I started reading up about this, that there were so many complexities in something so, so simple as phi four theory, classically. Okay. And there are still interesting unsolved questions. I think at least for the phi four theory, a lot of the fundamental questions have now been understood with this recent work of Manton et al that I'm referencing here. I would say though that in this boundary sign goal at the moment, we've used integrability in a rather stupid way. And I think that there may be more intelligent ways to do it because if you think about what the, my initial value problem is on the half line, it's sort of thinking about a theory on a quarter plane. Okay, I've got X negative and I've got T positive. Okay, and in, in this entire region, the theory is integrable, but we now have boundary conditions imposed in space and also in time, okay, at the side. And there, there's something called the focus method, which in principle ought to be able to help us with this and has been applied to things like the KDV equation on half line. But people studying that method never saw, you know, they never studied cases complicated enough to see this sort of complicated fractal structure. And there are some sort of technical challenges to applying the method in these cases. But I think it's an interesting challenge to see whether this could be done. And I would also, actually it's not on a bullet point here, but I, I think the quantum theory of this, especially in this sine Gordon case, would be very interesting. Because you're, as I say, people like Giuseppe Masada and so on have looked at 
losing integrability in the bulk and developing systematic techniques via things like form factor expansions and so on to study those. Well, in this case, I think we're in, you know, everything is much easier because we kind of understand the space of asymptotic in-states and out-states. They're just going to be sine Gordon multi-soliton states with breathers and what have you, with either all velocities going towards the boundary and then in the far future, all velocities going away from the boundary. Okay, it's just that the sort of quotes S matrix or the boundary reflection fact is much more complicated now. But at least we know the space on which it acts. Whereas in the case of losing integrability in something like phi four theory in the bulk, we're not even got so much control over that. So I think this is a nice environment where one should try and develop these techniques to understand the loss of integral. In principle, even in the classical theory, there's a whole well-developed theory for finite dimensional integral systems, KAM theory and so on. But as to my knowledge, field theory versions of this aren't really understood. So even in the classical theory, there's a lot to do. But I think in the quantum theory, it's a nice, nice thing to study too. Okay. And that's all. So some further reading is on this list here, but people can look at that later. So thanks very much. Thank you for that nice talk. So do we have questions for Patrick? So um, what would be the counterparts of uh, some of this phenomenon in quantum theory? For instance, what would what, an oscillon be? Quantum oscillon. I think, I mean, you, you can see the presence. So in, in well, as Luis and I remember from long ago, um, you can see, you know, it wouldn't be, I, I don't believe it wouldn't be sitting in your set of asymptotic states, but you would see hints of it in say resonance poles of S matrices. If you want to formulate the whole thing just via an S matrix formalism, you should see these as particular pole resonance poles in, uh, in, in your S matrix, I think. So that would be the place you would see it. But obviously they don't, at least you know, if people have understood and nothing complicated happens in the quantum theory, these things would not persist for all time. But there's, I, I feel there ought to be some better techniques for studying this because they really do exist for anomalously long times. Actually, people even, even have thought of this as possible dark matter candidates because they sort of exist for long enough that you know, there might be particles in the spectrum of the standard model that you should think about. But, uh, but yeah, in the quantum theory, I think, I think that would be the first place to see them. Um, the, the, the Robin boundary conditions look like, um, is it right that there's some kind of small field expansion of the integral that they can be thought of as a small field expansion of the integral? That's right, yes. And so I, my question then was, can you look at what happens if you include corrections to the Robin boundary conditions, like uh, so that you cubed and, oh, and then an whether somehow thought. you see some of the fractal structure start to disappear? That, and... That's a very nice thought. I hadn't thought about that, but <laughs> that's a very nice idea. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that would be fun to play with, except because it, the trouble is it takes like months to produce these wretched pictures. So <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that, that, that would be interesting to see. Let me ask uh, some more general conceptual question. You know, we like integrability for several reasons. One of them is that you may define a globally Cauchy problem, you know, that uh, when you give initial I... condition, when you give an initial condition, we are sure that you can prolongate the solution up to infinity. In non-integrable case, in general, it's not true. So, uh, did you study this uh, this question of global cautiousness? If you partook, uh, the... I didn't, but I believe people have. So, these theories are particularly well behaved. So, theories like, well, in some sense, from these sort of existence problems, I'm not quite sure there's a massive difference between integrability and non integrability. They're all equations of the same type. Mm -hmm. And I think there are general theorems. I mean, for example, I think even like the existence theorems for the long time existence of KDV solutions, I think the initial discussion to that made no reference to integrability. And, and I think in particular, these sorts of scalar theories like sine Gordon and phi four theory and so on, I, I think it's fairly safe, but I couldn't give you the exact reference, but it is something that people have looked at here. Any other questions? Standing up. Well, well, just uh, quickly, um, there is this, it was a bit related to Sarah's question actually, but there is this other scalar integral field theory, right? Where you have phi cubed terms mm -hmm. also. Um, I guess my question is, 
did you look at that model? What happens? I'm not sure what I'd do in that case, right? Because if you truncate, so you think about the Buller Dodd theory, right? Yes, or whatever. Is a, yeah. Maybe Buller Dodd isn't quite the right word, uh, Zakharov Shabbat or whatever. Um, the trouble is, if, if you just truncated that brutally, I, I suppose you could take one extra term or something, and you want to, you know, just phi cubed on its own isn't going to be a good model. But uh, anyway, I, I didn't look at it, mm. but uh, in principle, one, one could. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any further questions, so let's thank uh, Patrick again. I guess we have a coffee break now. <laughs>